there is a dreadful proneness in the heart of man to hypocrisy. We are told in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Men are naturally exceeding prone to deceive themselves and their opinion they have of themselves, and that from their pride and self-love. Their pride makes them prone to entertain high thoughts of themselves, to look on themselves through a magnifying glass, to give honorable appellations to themselves, to think themselves virtuous and religious. High thoughts of themselves, so they are ready to think God has high thoughts of themselves as well. And so, those that are indeed no Christians look on themselves as Christians and profess themselves to be such. And their self-love makes them exceeding prone to flatter themselves that they have the necessary qualifications of a happy state. They are very ready to think themselves free from what they heard inevitably exposes them to ruin. For every man would fain flatter himself that he is not like to be miserable, and he has a great deal of strong prejudice to blend into a thought that he has what is necessary to make him happy. And so many men that hear the threatenings and promises of God's word and live in places of light think themselves to be Christians when they're not. And so they make a false profession of Christianity. And so it is that false professors abound everywhere where the light of the gospel comes, as it comes everywhere where the visible church is. And then there is an exceeding proneness in men naturally, not only to deceive themselves, but to deceive others also. There is a seed or principle of Pharisaism in every man, in which he is prone to do things and to say things, to be seen of men to make false pretenses and professions to deceive them and to beget in high opinion of them and others. Men naturally seek the honor that is of man more than that which is of God and to regard more how they appear in the eyes of men than in God's eyes. And to be a Christian is credible in the church of God. And this is another reason why false professors abound in the visible church of Christ. But besides this, there is a proneness in the heart of man to endeavor to deceive God himself. Man naturally is prone to be putting on a mask in disguise even when he comes to appear before God, and to make false pretenses to him. And it is exceeding difficult to get men wholly off from a notion of God's being pleased with their fair outside, and many hope for acceptance with God from nothing else but a good outside. The reason why false professors abound in the church is to what pertains to such false professors. The second reason I would give of it is on the part of the true professors of Christianity. And the reason as to what pertains to them is that they can't search the hearts of others, those that are indeed members of the mystical body of Christ. They can't look into others' hearts and certainly determine who are of their society and who are not so as to refuse to admit or receive any to be of their company, or to partake with them in their external privileges, but only such as are truly godly. Christ, in the rules that he has given for the reception of persons into the visible church, has wisely accommodated himself to the nature and state of his people here in this world. He has given them no power to search others' hearts, for that he has reserved to himself as his own prerogative. Revelation 2, verse 23. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the hearts and tries the reins. To go to make them judges of other hearts would be not only to exalt them above their natures, but also to instate them in his throne and to invest them with that which belongs and proper to God only. Their fellow servants in Christ never committed to them power of judging their fellow servants. The rule that Christ has given his church to proceed by in admitting others to external privileges with him is to proceed only by what is visible and external, for it is only that that is liable to our observation. As to the heart that is invisible that belongs to God to judge of and not us. The officers and rulers of the church they are none of them searchers of men's hearts. And though some of them may be well skilled in experimental religion and soul concerns, yet Christ has not seen fit to make their private judgment of the state of men's souls, their rule and admission of members into the church of Christ. For they are but poor, fallible men at best, 
And if they should try to reject all that they think are not truly godly, they may reject many that are so. And therefore Christ has given to none of his ministers power to separate wheat and tares in this world as judges, lest while they go about to root up the tares, they should root up the wheat also. Therefore he would have both grow together until the harvest, until he comes as judge to separate them, who alone is equal to the business of this. Matthew 13, verses 29 and 30. So that nothing is left to the church as a rule with respect to admission or exclusion of members, but those things that are visible to the eye of the public, and not those things that appear to the private opinions of men. But such a public visibility won't exclude false professors. So it comes to pass that false Christians are at all times and everywhere mixed with true in a visible church. Lastly, in respect to Christ, the head of the church, why is it he so orders the state of the visible church in this world that many false professors shall be in it? Two reasons may be given of it. First, Christ would not anticipate the work of the day of judgment and do the work of that day before the time. If Christ should now so order it that true and false Christians should be precisely distinguished and separated, in this he would do the work of the day of judgment beforehand, for the business of that day is to make such a separation. But Christ would not anticipate the work of that day. For everything there is a season and a time for every business and purpose, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1. But the present time is not the time of judgment. It doesn't appear in God's sight a proper time. The present time is the time of probation, and a future time a time of judgment. To do the work of judgment now would be to confound a day of probation and a day of judgment together. There is a certain appointed time for judging, a day for separating sheep from goats, wheat from chaff. The appointed day shall declare thee things. The harvest is the proper time for separating wheat from tares, and therefore Christ says, let both grow together until the harvest, Matthew thirteen thirty, And therefore Christ himself, while on earth and acting as the head of the visible church, did not separate true professors from hypocrites, but admitted Judas among the disciples to like external privileges with them, though he knew that he was a devil, because he would not do the work of the day of judgment beforehand. Secondly, there are wise ends in which Christ so orders the state of the visible church that many false professors shall be in it. Particularly for these two reasons. First, as a means of gathering in the elect. By means of such a state of things, many natural men are in the visible church of Christ in which they enjoy external privileges of visible Christians and are the constant subjects of the means of grace which proves the means of many of them being afterwards brought savingly home to Christ and into the visible church. And this is a principal means of upholding the church of Christ in the world from age to age. If no natural men were in the visible church of Christ, then no natural men would be the adoring subjects of the appointed means of grace, and so wouldn't enjoy those means of their conversion that now they do. But one end of the ordinary dispensation of the ordinances of Christ is the conversion of sinners. For the rendering, secondly, of reprobates more inexcusable, and a greater manifestation of divine justice in their condemnation, wicked men are rendered abundantly the more inexcusable for being members of the visible church, for living under such light, such advantages, and their guilt becomes a greater for their sinning as they do against the light in their profession. And this the scripture teaches us as one end why it is ordered that some men live under means of grace. Isaiah was sent to preach to some in Israel for this end. Christ gives this reason why he preached to the unbelieving obstinate Jews in Matthew 13 verse 14. And therefore it is said that Christ is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel, and that he shall be a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation to sinners. So to others he is set for a stone of stumbling, 1 Peter 2, verse 8. Application So we need not wonder when we find it is so. Many professors come in. Hence they do greatly err that go about to make a separation between true and false Christians in the world as though they had power of discerning and certainly distinguishing between godly and ungodly, 
and so will venture positively and absolutely to decide concerning the state of other souls. They do err that will positively determine for persons that they are converted, but more especially they who are positive and peremptory in determining against them, being forward to say of one and another that they never were converted, and that they had not a jot of true grace in their hearts. By such censoriousness, persons certainly do that which is not agreeable to the state and circumstances of the church in this world. If men in the present state had been endowed with such power, Christ never would have so ordered it, that true and false Christians should evermore be mixed together in the world. Such persons take upon them the part of the judge and anticipate the work of the day of judgment.